We all are. And I, now you see all of those memes on social media that's saying, I'm just going to put my phone away for the weekend and that's going to be my vacation, yeah. is just getting away from the phone because it is, the accessibility is quite a bit. Yeah. It, it's, um, do you think that, so I'm wondering, the thing I keep kind of wondering in, in from an educational sphere, and you and I were talking about this right before we started the podcast, was, you know, do you th- how do you think that people are going to want to engage? Are they going to continue, your generation, my generation, older generations, are they going to want to continue to engage virtually or are there things that, or, or are there things that they're going to want to do that have to necessarily be done on a face-to-face, like in physical person? I think it really depends on the personality mm. and the person. I think that the delivery of CEs and information is probably going to have to have multiple forms, some virtual, some in person. I personally like the in person. Um, I had my first CE today in person in over a year, and it was really great to sit next to people and to listen to the person and see, you know, their their gestures and smiles and um, all of that. So I, I enjoy that part of it, but I do. I think that it's going to have to be delivered mm. in various various forms. Yeah, I, I'm ch- still trying to wrap my mind around what, because I, I think you're right. I think it's, it is going to be various forms. I also think that we are going to probably see just like, I don't think this is political in any way, but our country is becoming much more fractioned into sort of um, uh, maybe columns or groups or like these smaller communities. Uh And I think we're probably going to see some of that as well, like within the profession. I'm seeing, you know, like this group over here, this group over there, this group over there. And you'll kind of gravitate to a group. And that's where you're going to tap into a lot of the other additional information that because there's trust that's built in that group. Um, Because I know that this person is going through similar experiences as I am. They're dealing with similar things as I am like, um, Somehow I got subscribed to the American Association of Corporate Optometrists. And so I see, you know, they, I get emails in my inbox all the time and I, you know, I'm not a corporate optometrist, so I don't necessarily deal with the same things that they would deal with all the time, but, but there's probably a lot of things that we deal with. Um, so I, I'm just seeing some of that and I wonder how much that's going to come into play and, and it, what worries me. And I think we need to, as a, as a group, um, still have to understand like it is super important to be a member of your state association and the AOA. Maybe they're not doing the exact same things for us. I mean, they're really doing the exact same things for us as they've always been doing, but maybe we don't look at them the same. Um, and I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. I'm just saying that if we, I'm worried that gravitating to a specific group, um, will weaken the strength that we've had to, to be able to get us to where we are right now. Hello and welcome to the Chris Will Podcast on iCode Media. Today I had a great conversation with Dr. Michaela Crowley about her mode of practice. And I met Michaela a few years back and it was interesting to me just her different mode of practice than mine. And so we have a pretty heavy concentration in private practice conversations on this podcast. And so I wanted to just talk to her about her perspectives uh, in a ODMD practice, as well as kind of her thoughts on the future of education and the future of our profession uh, related to our organization. So it was a fun conversation. As always, be sure to subscribe to the podcast, write a review, share it with your friends, and support those who support us. We've been providing myopia control treatments in our practice for years. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, Cooper Vision has received FDA approval of its innovative MySight One Day contact lens. This will be the cornerstone of a comprehensive myopia management approach to be offered by Cooper Vision. This daily wear, single use contact lens is the first and only FDA approved product clinically proven to slow the progression of myopia when initially prescribed for children 8 to 12 years old and when compared to children in the control group wearing a single vision one day contact lens. Check out the show notes for all the specific prescribing details and to get more information about this lens and how you can begin to offer it in your practice. I think one of the things that um, was interesting to me when we yet met like two years ago um, was just your mode of practice and why you chose it. And um, so can you give a, me a little sense of you know your path, where you went to school, and then... Um, you know, why you chose to practice, where you practice, the way you practice. 
Sure. Um, so currently I am at an ODMD practice in Massachusetts, about a half an hour outside of the city. We have four locations. Um, I started in eye care when I was 18 years old. Actually, my first job was on my 18th birthday where I got hired at Pearl Vision. And it was a great job, um, just frame styling, not just frame styling. It was a great great job to start and get to know eye care and then I fell in love with the eyes and everything visual um, and helping people in that sense and so then I decided to go to optometry school. I went to optometry school at Nova, Southeastern University. Knew that, yeah. Yes, and I graduated from there in 2016. I started at private optometry practice, which was great, and then here I am uh, in a well, multidisciplinary you went, practice. Oh, you went through a lot there. Okay, so yeah. you, you started a private optometry practice. Where at? I mean, you don't have to t- tell me the specific name, but like what state? It was in Massachusetts. It was always in Massachusetts. Yes. So you've always practiced in Massachusetts. Yes. You must be, feel free right now. I, what do you mean? Because now you, you have uh, authority, right? You have oh. more authority to treat glaucoma. And um, is, is that, have they actually, it's been signed, so the law has been signed, but the regulations aren't in place yet. So do you have to go, do you guys, do you know, do you guys have to go through more education or any certification or anything like that? Yes. So that was a huge step. And this past year, it was gone into law and um, done the first on January 1st of this year. Um, and we do currently have to go through a certification process. So there will be a rigorous th- certification process. Um, there are some exemptions that the state board is trying to figure out with regards to you know, residency or reciprocity, um, but I did not do a residency. And so I will have to do a, um, a certification course, which we're signed up for. Um, that is going to start this summer. So it will be 10 modules of didactic, and then we have to do a clinical portion and take a test after that. Oh, my God. Gosh, that is rigorous. It's okay, though. I mean, it just makes it so that we're all up to date, and it's a good thing. I think uh, I think you're right about that. I think you know when I think about my training and when Nebraska gets the authority to do some of the things that I was trained to do in Oklahoma. Um, I think a, like a really onerous process for it is probably unnecessary, but most of us want it anyway. Like I would, even me, I'd be like, "Oh, I want to do as many as I can before you know they're on my patients." And so I, I see that right. If it, it's been five years since you've actively treated glaucoma on your own, or even trained for that, right? Even though you probably have patients that you that you've been treating, you just have you know you have somebody else that's got to actually do it, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, so then you were in private practice. And how long were you in private practice for? For about two years. Okay. What drew you, first of all, what drew you to private practice initially? Initially, I I come from a family of small business owners. And Mm. so I thought that that's what I wanted to do was um, own my own practice. And also just the thought where I came from, you know, working in different modalities before I even went to optometry school, it was just always my goal. I had that optician background and thought that it was what I wanted to do. Um, And so that's where I started. And I still enjoy it. Uh, It's just that like I said, I, I'm, I'm somewhere different now. What what pushed you someplace different? So again, because I because I I am with you on that story, and I, again, I think it's fine. I'm not knocking, but it's a path that I don't understand. So what was the kind of inflection point where you said, you know, private practice just isn't for me. I I want to take this other path, and then tell me about that other path. It really just sort of fell into my hands. Mm. I wasn't necessarily looking for it. When I graduated from optometry school, I, I interviewed at a few different places, and where I'm, I am is one of them. Um, and really, I, I went there because the ophthalmologist treated my grandfather for glaucoma, and they did such an amazing job. Mm. Um, they're just stellar. Um, so that's how I ended up where I am. Yeah. So then you, you um, well, when you think about the idea of, owning a business and owning a practice um, or owning a business, is that just completely out of your mind now? You're like, I don't even need to do that because I'm so fulfilled doing what I'm doing or is it sort of in the back of your mind? What, what do you wrestle with? Personally, it's not in yeah. my mind anymore. I don't really have the interest. I'm so satisfied um, with what I'm doing. But again, that's not for everybody. And that's the beauty of optometry is that there really are so many different modes of practice in which we we can um, for those different personalities and, and what people want to do. Yeah. And um, so that's, again, the beauty of optometry. Yeah. I mean, do you, when you, um, when you think about your experiences now, are you seeing patients 
generally if you're not at a meeting like this, are you seeing patients five days a week? Are you seeing patients four days a week? Because I know you do some traveling and speaking and some of that stuff. How do you handle all of those sorts of activities? When I am not traveling, speaking, or doing some of the professional affairs um, tasks that I do for the practice, I am seeing patients. Mm -hmm. Um, My weekly uh, schedule is Monday through Friday clinic, typically. And then just like everybody else, I block my schedule when I need to come to these meetings or speaking engagements. Um, I do take one one day a month where I go around to other practices. Um, One of the roles is, uh, again, like I said, almost essentially a professional affairs, um, where it's the um, practice liaison to our optometric community. And it's just to make sure that that connection and that that relationship stays in place so that we can all, you know, give our patients and treat our patients the best that we possibly can. So are you, are, is your practice a primary referral? Like, is it a referral practice or do you, you do primary care there as well and take referrals? I do. Yes. So I primarily will. So usually our specialists will take the referrals. Um, I will take referrals for scleral lenses and, and things like that. Yeah. Do you, um. So when you when you decide to um, like speak or do other work for for companies, what um, like how did how did you start doing that? I think that's kind of a like people don't really understand how that happens or or the evolution of that. So for you, I mean, you're kind of a an up and coming star. You've been out of school for just a handful of years, and so. Like, what was the first opportunity that you had to say, hey, come come on board and, and speak for us or do this or do that? Like, what was that and how did you manage it? I don't think I'm an up and coming star. You that's, don't think so? No, that's the first time I've heard that. No, um, that's not true. Yeah. Really? Um, so really Cooper Vision. Um, I started with Cooper Vision. So when I was in school, I was part of AOSA. Mm-hmm. And so I was on the board of trustees for AOSA and I had the chance to. Did I not know that? I did don't we know. Did about that before? Are you AOSA? I was. A, yeah, I was. Ah. Yeah. Were you a long time before you were there? Executive <laughs> council. I was, I was a president um, ah, in my year. Yeah. Okay. Two thousand and seven. Uh, Two thousand seven. Two thousand eight. I was not president. No. I was not on the executive council. It's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I was part of AOSA. I can't believe we haven't talked about that I in the know, past. That's crazy. And um, while Who I was, was at the president when when you were there, because that'll jog my memory. Jimmy Diem. Oh, Jimmy was there. Was there? Oh, okay. And so he was a year ahead of you. Jimmy was a year ahead of me. Yes. So he was in my trustee elect year. And then my trustee year, it was Devin Sasser. Okay. So yeah, cool. Very cool. Small world. Such a small world. So yes, you absolutely are an up and coming star. I I pegged you right because, um, because obviously like the board of trustees, I think, I think without sounding like haughty, right. You get, you do get involved. You have a passion for the profession. You have these different areas that you want to pursue. It's not, uh, it is definitely more than a job at that point. So, um, so then Cooper, you you encountered them with when you were in AOSA. Yes. Okay. Tell me about that. And just a random dinner. Oh, I was also part of CLCS. So while uh-huh. I was in AOSA, I was the national, the student national liaison for a, for the CLCS. And so we were at a dinner. So you and know Shalou then? I do. Well. She's awesome. She is so great. I'm trying to get her on the podcast. At Shalou, she, yeah. I think you should do it. I think she should too. <laughs> um, so we were at a dinner and just met them. And so as a student, just had the opportunity to get to know some of the people in the professional affairs department. And then here we are years later and just doing some speaking engagements. How do you like that? I love it. You know, it really keeps me at the top of my game um, with regards to maintaining, you know, information on research and modern products and why they can benefit our patients um, and bringing them into into practice and then sharing, you know, clinical pearls. Um, really, that information that we all can share with each other is so valuable. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, so do you usually uh, speak away from Massachusetts when you do that? Or do you, are there enough people uh, in Massachusetts that that you're speaking to, like when they ask you to go do those things? It really depends. Um, with Cooper Vision specifically, it, it tends to be more on that national level where in this past year we did so many podcasts or we did webinars. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was a, a different setting or scene and way that we delivered the information. Um, so that was more on a national scale, not necessarily Massachusetts. Uh, but I have been traveling more now that we're back to traveling more within the Massachusetts region mm-hmm. or New England region. And that's probably, you know, what I've noticed is when, when these things come up, um, 
they sort of ask you, like, what do you want to do? Like, what, do you want to do a lot? Do you want to do a few? Do you want to be local? Do you want to be... And, and I think they, at least in my experience in local in our area, sometimes that can be, they don't want to have a local doc in that area because there might be like connotation one way or the other. They might, people might feel like there's competition. So they're not, they don't want to share ideas as easily, those sorts of things. Now, from a, from a standpoint of like, our office is a vision source office. And so like, I never worry about competition in, in that sense. I never worry about um, like sharing ideas in general, but I know that there are people that are, that do. And so, um, so I, I see where companies will say, well, do you want to do it locally? Do you want to be regionally? Um, Cause you know, if they were flying you from Massachusetts to Los Angeles, that's a long flight, right? It is. is it, have you done it yet? I haven't done the Los Angeles. I think the furthest that I went, this was a few years ago. Uh, it, it was Texas, yeah. actually, for a TOA meeting. So that, that was a longer one. Yeah. When you, um, when you go there, do you, well, actually, have you ever been on a flight that's been from Massachusetts, from like Boston to LAX? Oh, yes. Do you do it often? Not often, but I, I have. Yeah. Many, I it's mean, a long flight. It is a long flight. I think the one, um, so when I was preparing students for their boards, uh, I did a course on Friday, Friday, Saturday, and I, I, I want to say that I was, I started out in Philadelphia. So I did a Friday, Saturday course in Philadelphia, and then I flew from Philadelphia to, uh, to LAX, and that was such a long flight, and it had to be. It had to be 2012 or 2011 because we were writing um, uh, a book for like to help docs prepare for board certification. So it must have been 2012. And so I was like, I got six and a half hours. I can just do nothing but write, you know. And um, but that was the only time I've ever taken that flight. It's by far the longest flight I've ever taken. It is useful to get some of the yeah. administrative stuff oh done gosh. and writing whatever it is that you need to write. It's useful time. No one disturbs you. Yeah. Just put those headphones on and, and get some work done. So totally. I find it to be valuable time. Um, I guess, how do you do it? How do you manage all of this? And um, So I'm like you, you know, when I, um, I'm interviewing here, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, no, I'm like you, I, I'm really efficient. So I, I see patients. I, right now I, I see patients three days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then, uh, Thursday, Friday, I, um, and you know, while you're there in the practice, you know, I, I, my patient schedule is about 15 patients a day. Um, some days it's more, some days it's one or two less, but I'm, I'm as booked as I want to be. Um, and so I have time in between patients. I have time at lunch to administer the practice, but then I also do stuff out, you know, on Thursdays and Fridays for my practice. And then, um, and then I just look at things like what's interesting to me. So, um, and I think the more I get to do things, the more I'm, I'm more and more picky. I'll look at something and I'll say, that's just not, I'm not your guy for that. And, um, and so like, uh, some things are, are, you know, um, I've told people like, if you want me to extol the benefits of like this specific medication or this specific, like, that's not, that's not my purview. That's not where I bring value. And, and I think there's a lot of people that do a better job at that than I do. Um, but there are, but what kind of, um, so I, what I do is I look at like, is this something that's going to excite me? Cause if it doesn't excite me then I'm just going to kind of, I know I'm just not going to be, I'll try to do as good a job as I could do, but I'll never do as good a job as I should. And so, um, so that's the key. And so for what excites me, uh, that has always excited me is just this. I, and I think you and I talked about this a couple of years ago. It's just, I really believe that patients, um, get the best care from primary eye care from their optometrist. And I also believe that optometrists should be allowed to, um, deliver care that is to the fullest extent of their knowledge, education, and training. And so, but then I also see these big deterrents to that, right? So like, um, what, what makes me passionate is if I can see it, if I see a deterrent to delivering full service for full scope eye care for patients, um, I want to figure out a way around that, right? I want to figure out a way that like, here's a problem. I see this is going to be a problem for integrating this new technology or integrating this new medication. Like if you think about medications right now, like uh, some of the medications that are coming down the pipe that are going to be presbyopic medications. There's a lot of big hurdles that these companies are going to have to overcome. Um, I, I think they're great 
medications. I think there's, it's, it's awesome to have that tool in our toolbox. Um, but there are some big hurdles that companies are going to have to overcome because it's different than the model that has existed. That excites me, right? How do we figure this out? How do we make it so that the everyman, right, can integrate this into their practice and it just is seamless within their practice flow? Um, how do we uh, know how, uh, I mean, one of the things that excites me also is, you know, if I'm, if I'm providing full service optometry in my practice and I want to treat glaucoma, but I don't have a mechanism to get compensated for that, or I don't fully understand the revenue cycle of how that's going to be profitable in my practice. Like I want to do it. I want to do it great. Um, and, and, uh, but if I, if I don't see the way that it can be as profitable as providing routine eye services, right. Then I'm going to naturally gravitate away from doing that. And so I get inspired on trying to help people understand how they can do those things. So like that's that's my barometer right now is like if if a company asks me to come like um uh give them thoughts on something it's it's almost never any more like front of this front of the house stuff that that I'm really going to be great at or that I'm that I'm going to be really excited about it's it's like okay I can do the front front of the house stuff if it's it's revolving around one of those kind of areas that I see as like, this is going to be a barrier for people to integrate and people that have access to that type of care. Sure. I mean, isn't that the art of saying no, right? Yeah. Is, is figuring I'm getting better out, at it. Yeah. I still haven't gotten there. No. no. Um, but figuring out, you know, what makes you go and what excites you and integrating or, or aligning yourself in that, in that way um, so that you can, you know, do what, what make, what excites you. So what if if you were to have have you clarified that yet? It takes it does take us some time, right? Cause, it takes time because part of and I my experience on the AOSA I've said this on the podcast before, but my experience on the AOSA board um, was always like I just said yes, I just said yes to everything, and and a yes here begot a, another opportunity there, which was good, and so I say yes again, right? And yeah, and so um, so it was really hard for me to be able to step back, and I, again, I'm still working on it, but I would say that I'm way better at it now than I was two years ago, and even better than I was a year ago, um, but I still have a ways to go. So if you had to clarify what your like thing is that you like to do, do you have sort of like this overarching? thing that you can kind of bounce bounce off of? I really just enjoy lifting optometrists up, learning from one another, figuring out, you know, the best way that we can deliver care to patients, whether that has to be with techniques or if it has to do with new products, technology. So really that includes putting yourself in a position where you can do all of those things, you know, going to CEs, going to these meetings, talking to industry leaders and your peers, and then going to clinic and listening to your patients. Um, that's really what, what keeps me going, keeps me mo- going forward is, is just um, learning more and, and lifting one another up. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, um, it is a challenge because there is this balance between like the clinical aspects of our care, like what we're doing in the exam room and then as you get busier and busier, I think there's this natural, um, I was talking to Amanda Lee about this and I've talked to Scott Schachter about it and um, where you kind of make these transitions and um, and there's there it's hard to know, okay, if I go away, like I have no desire by the way, and I'll, I'll state this right now, I love owning my practice, I love seeing patients. I would not be as effective, I believe. I'm not saying everybody couldn't be like this, but I wouldn't be as effective as I am doing the other things. And I probably wouldn't be as passionate about seeing patients as I am if I, um, if I didn't have the other things. They kind of feed each other. But I guess there's, you know, what I see happen to a lot of people is they, um, you know, they kind of take these steps into doing consulting or working in industry, and then they're fully in industry. And man, I think that's kind of risky. I would view it as risky. I guess, yeah, because and if you talk to a lot of them, they say, I miss seeing patients, Yeah, right? Um, I don't know about risky. It depends on where you want uh, your... I would worry about I'd get fired. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'd have no practice and no job. Yeah. Um, I guess it just depends on what you want to do, Yeah. right? Yeah, and, and every time I mention that to somebody, they all say it's not risky. Like every time I bring that up. So that, that tells me that they've kind of... Um, they have over, they've, they've kind of come over the, the idea of like, well, um, 
I'm ready to be done seeing patients. They they might miss it, but, um, and who knows? I mean, in five years and 10 years, I might say the same thing. I might like right now, I love the balance I have, but in five or 10 years, I might say, gosh, I don't want to do one or the other anymore. Um, when you think about your state association, um, when you came out of school from the AOSA, was there an easy path to connect with your state association? Or do you think that, yeah, I'll just leave it that way. Yeah, you know, and I think that the fact that being in the AOSA and being involved just as a student, um, that it is just that linear, you know, path that that you do get involved it's just the relationships that you make um, and sometimes you, you do things that you don't even realize it right and you go wow I'm here um, and and so that's that's how you can get involved in those ways but yeah I do think it was easy I mean the Massachusetts um, the MSO does a really good job of reaching out and and reaching out to the students and asking if they want to get involved and in, in using them as resources um, so it, it was an easy path yeah, I'm one of the things when I was and probably a thing now, but when I was on the board of trustees, that was this was the mismatch because I think the NOA does a good job too, and I think when I talk to most associations, they seem to do a good job, but there's this still this gap where you know you get out of school and then something happens, right? I don't know what it is, uh, but something happens, and that's where you lose a number of those people or historically transitioning from their AOSA membership to an AOA membership. Um, was that still an issue in 2016 that, that people that AOSA and AOA were trying to manage? It was. And I know that they're trying to make it less expensive because finances are a real factor in all of this. Um, and you know, when you're done school, you're, you're trying to figure out what it is that you want to do and you're trying to align yourself and get into the mode of practice that you want to be in. Um, there's so much that you're learning. And so I think that that could be a factor as well. Um, but yes, they certainly were, um, you know, trying to figure out how we can not have that gap. Yeah. Yeah. I just think like it's a tough one to overcome because people want to be needed. Right. I mean, um, but we can, but like you and I only get to see things. It's, it's hard for us to not see things through our jaded lens of the AOSA. And, and also when you are serving in that capacity, you, um, people do kind of trust you more, right? They, they respect that you've been uh, at least involved at some level. And, um, and so there, I think maybe we, maybe you and I were given a little bit of a pass and given more responsibility, um, or, or understood that responsibility more than somebody that is just, you know, they're, they're in optometry school. They love the profession. They want to be part of the profession, but they come out and they're kind of like, I need to make a paycheck and, you know, I, and I'm not having any income and I got, you know, $250,000 of student loans that I got to pay off. And so it's just really challenging. I don't, I don't know that there's a good answer. It, it's, um, yeah, I, I don't, it's just, it's just a, it's an interesting one to, to ponder because I believe that having them actively involved will bind them to the association. You're probably never not going to be an MSO member. Definitely not. Right. I mean, just for the, again, that organized optometry and having a team and being able to reach out to people when you do have a question, um, they're a good resource. And that is invaluable to me and something that I will always dedicate myself to. And um, just to, again, I guess, go back to that whole lift one another up when we're all in a team and all working together. Um, that ultimately comes down to that we're able to do our jobs much better too. You're in a little different generation than, than I am. Do you think that there is maybe not generation, but you grew up with stuff that I didn't grow up with, right? Uh, and so do you think there's a difference in, I mean, just in the, the eight years between us, is there a difference in the way that your peers want to access resources like meetings, like, I mean, I grew up with no you know, no phone. Like my first iPhone was when I graduated. It was after I graduated optometry. In fact, I was, I was probably, probably 2010. But like in your case, you probably had one. I had my first Nokia phone when I was 14 years yeah. old. Yeah. Um, so my whole life it's been virtual or, or electronic and, and having to, you know, learn how to do everything on a computer. And then it evolved, right? I, I 
couldn't imagine taking classes online, um, but that's a thing. Um, and so, yes, I mean, my peers definitely probably expect to, to see resources in a more virtual sense, um, apps and, you know, more emails and just that type of conversation or even text messages. I mean, talking to people and coordinating things, it used to be voicemails mm -hmm. and now it's all through text message. So it's certainly a different environment. Um, and I think it's probably a lot different, even just eight years. I mean, as you said, your first cell phone was what? After optometry well, no, school? No, no, I didn't say oh, cell phone. iPhone. I said iPhone. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, That's a big a, difference. <laughs> no, I had a cell phone when I was, I mean, I, you know, it started out, you know, you get a car. I, it was probably in the nineties. I had a car. I bought a car and then my parents got a cell phone for me that I was only supposed to use because it was, you got, you charged by the minute, right? Yep. So I was only supposed to use in case of emergency and then pretty soon they had un unlimited. So nobody cared anymore. And that was probably in the, but it was still a flip phone, right? Flip phone yep. all through optometry school. And then, um, and I remember right when we graduated, one of my buddies got like that first iPhone and I was like, holy cow, that's amazing. You know, and it still took me a couple of years. And what I told people was like, I don't want to be that accessible now. I keep thinking back about that as like, I'm very accessible. I'm, I'm way more express, accessible than I wanted to be 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We all are. And I, now you see all of those memes on social media that's saying, I'm just going to put my phone away for the weekend and that's going to be my vacation yeah. is just getting away from the phone because it is the accessibility is quite a bit. Yeah. It, it's, um, do you think that, so I'm wondering, the thing I keep kind of wondering in, in from an educational sphere, and you and I were talking about this right before we started the podcast was, you know, do you, th how do you think that people are going to want to engage? Are they going to continue it? Your generation, my generation, older generations, are they going to want to continue to engage virtually or are there things that, or, or are there things that they're going to want to do that have to necessarily be done on a face to face, like in physical person? I think it really depends on the personality mm. and the person. I think that the delivery of CEs and information is probably going to have to have multiple forms, some virtual, some in person. I personally like the in person. Um, I had my first CE today in person in over a year, and it was really great to sit next to people and to listen to the person and see, you know, their their gestures and smiles and um, all of that. So I, I enjoy that part of it, but I do. I think that it's going to have to be delivered mm. in various various forms. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to wrap my mind around what, because I, I think you're right. I think it's, it is going to be various forms. I also think that we are going to probably see just like, I don't think this is political in any way, but our country is becoming much more fractioned into sort of um, uh, maybe columns or groups or like these smaller communities. Uh and I think we're probably going to see some of that as well. Like within the profession, I'm seeing, you know, like this group over here, this group over there, this group over there, and you'll kind of gravitate you to a group. And that's where you're going to tap into a lot of the other additional information that, and because there's trust that's built in that group. Um, because I know that this person is going through similar experiences as I am. They're dealing with similar things as I am. Like, um, Somehow I got subscribed to the American Association of Corporate Optometrists. And so I see, you know, they, I get emails in my inbox all the time and I, you know, I'm not a corporate optometrist, so I don't necessarily deal with the same things that they would deal with all the time, but, but there's probably a lot of things that we deal with. Um, so I, I'm just seeing some of that and I wonder how much that's going to come into play and, and it, what worries me. And I think we need to, as a, as a group, um, still have to understand like it is super important to be a member of your state association and the AOA. Maybe they're not doing the exact same things for us. I mean, they're really doing the exact same things for us as they've always been doing, but maybe we don't look at them the same. Um, and I'm not saying we should or shouldn't. I'm just saying that if we, I, I'm worried that gravitating to a specific group um, will weaken the strength that we've had to, to be able to get us to where we are right now. Yeah. I mean, it is so important to have an umbrella. Right. Somebody who can, you know, even though you have those subsections, something that integrates all of them together and keeps everybody together because we are a profession. There's different specialties within our profession. And certainly you're going to gravitate towards those 
lots of subspecialties just so that you can learn more, right? That's your specialty. And so that's what you want to learn more about. Um, but to have an umbrella and somebody who, you know, is organizing all of that is really crucial to, like you said, the survival. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I think, I think it happens on both ends and I'll be respectful of your time. Cause I know I, I told you we would be, um, we're right up on that time limit. But what's interesting to me is that I think it can run two ways. One is um, just like any other community. If I don't know much about like another community that's, that's just, you know, maybe it's a different faith or a different, you know, socioeconomic class, then um, if we're never together, it's hard to really um, like figure out common ground and figure out why, why things might be different. That's what I'm concerned about. And, and I think on two ends of it, one is we can say, you know, we're here at, at AOA and there's kind of this classic or historic perspective. Like it's, you know, um, it is doing something different. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's even true, but there's a perspective that uh, on both ends that maybe it's for private practitioners. It's for, but, but like, um, it's not for corporate optometry or the, but I don't think that's true. I think the the point is, and what I hope happens is that there's still enough communication among the groups, enough idea sharing among groups and enough um, camaraderie under the groups, because you certainly, I don't think that actually is true, but I think there's probably a perspective of that from both ends that uh, you have to be, you have to have this mindset and this type of practice to go to this meeting. Um, and it's, that it could be a challenge, I guess is my point. Hopefully it doesn't become that way. Yeah. Yeah. You don't have to agree with me. I'm just, I'm just pontificating. Sure. You know, it's just interesting to me and, and I just see more of it and I hope it just doesn't go that way. Yeah. So, um, biggest challenge to the profession. What do you think it is? Ooh, that is a loaded question. Or maybe question. I'll even ask this biggest opportunity. Biggest opportunity or biggest challenge to the profession. I might have to get back to you on that one. Really? That's a loaded question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess the... Well, let me ask it this way then. What's your, what's the, um, in your practice, what is the most exciting opportunity that you think is going to kind of evolve over the next five to 10 years? Honestly, with my mode of practice, I just love the multidisciplinary approach. Um, having that primary eye care and then all of the subspecialties. So if we could integrate that, I think that that is huge. And if we could really work together with our ophthalmological colleagues, that maybe that's my, my, my thought of our biggest opportunity is working together so that we can deliver that patient care. Um, because I truly feel like I, I work in a team environment where that is what it comes down to, is taking care of people in making sure that their eyesight and that everything, you know, is, is intact, whether it means, you know, the primary eye care aspect, subspecialty aspect. So if we could integrate more with the ophthalmology, optometry community, I do think that that would be a, a great opportunity for us as a profession. Awesome. Michaela Crowley, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks so much. Appreciate it.